All right. Hi, everybody. This is Joanne Manister, Science Goddess on Twitter with Read Science. And I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Jeff Schomeyer. And today we will be talking to Mara. Okay. I'm so sorry to ask you how you say your name. What <laughs> is it? Vistendahl. Vistendahl. Yeah. Okay. I sort of thought that might be it, but why not? <laughs> why not be thorough? So um, with Mara Vistendahl, who is the author of several books and um, let's see. So I will start with the first book of hers that I read before I read your bio. I read her book, Unnatural Selection. Uh, it was um, on the, uh, it was a Pulitzer Prize finalist, which you don't find out till they announce the Pulitzer Prize, right? Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> right. Um, yeah. so this is Chase, Choosing Boys Over Girls and the Consequences of a World Full of Men. I don't know how I ended up with this book, if someone sent it to me, or I just thought mm -hmm. that looks interesting. But I really enjoyed it, and it de certainly deserves its place on the the finalist of Pulitzer Prize. Mm. So, um, and then, um, but we are going to. She, she, you also have a long, long form story that's in an ebook, and I read it too, and I enjoyed it. Called "And the City Swallowed Them," and I remember it was about a model, and I can't remember much else it was sort of like a yeah a canadian model who was murdered in shanghai and there's a lot of intrigue around the crime and um and, and there's an interesting twist at the end right <laughs> right so it's been yeah. a while since i read that one but today we are going to talk about her book the scientist and the spy a true story of china the fbi and industrial espionage now i've mentioned all of her books but i haven't talked much about what else you do and all the other wonderful places you get to write about science. So um, Mara Vistendel covered China's renaissance in science and technology as a correspondence for science in Shanghai. She has also written for The Atlantic, Popular Science, and Wired. She's the author of the books I've mentioned. Um, and um, you also, oh, I didn't see this. You were a finalist for the general nonfiction for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Excellent. Anyway, a proficient <laughs> Mandarin speaker and a former national fellow at New America. She lived in China for eight years and now resides in Minneapolis with her family. So we are so glad you're here. Um, and normally at this point, I would have just Jeff uh, take over. But um, I thought I would ask this, this very obvious question. What's it mm. like to have published a book and compete with COVID-19 pandemics? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been interesting. It, um, my book launched in early February, and that was around the same time that everyone in the United States was starting to talk about what was happening in mm -hmm. China. And, you know, as I, because I lived there for many years and know many journalists there, and um, that was a natural readership, readership for the book. Uh, it did make it difficult to get publicity in some ways, but on the other hand, uh, there were a lot of people who were suddenly stuck at home who did um, yeah. start reading and listening to audiobooks. And you know, it's possible that we'll see the same thing happen in the United States. Um, although I guess the qu the question here is what, how how strict the measures um, taken by by various cities and states will be. Um, so you know it's uh, it was <laughs> good and bad. And right now we're at this very unusual place where you know not just authors are affected, but almost anybody uh, promoting anything and you know doing any sort of work. And so spring events have been canceled. Um, independent bookstores are trying to come up with interesting ways to still sell mm -hmm. books and get people talking about books. And um, we'll see, you know, in, in China, people came up with a lot of innovative ways to deal with um, the lockdown and deal with being under quarantine. And maybe some of that will happen here. Oh, you know what, though, if, yeah. if authors start talking about their books at you know, online instead of at bookstores I'm nowhere near, I would mm -hmm. tune in. I yeah. absolutely would. So yeah, I'd say go for it. You know, this <laughs> could increase your audience a little bit more even. So, Hopefully. Great. Hopefully. Great. Great. Well, Jeff, why don't we start talking about uh, Mara's book? The official, the official beginning. The official now. beginning. <laughs> yeah, such as it is. Uh, <laughs> this, this story, this beautifully reported story, that you've given us is 
bizarre and pretty unbelievable <laughs> uh, story about corn breeding and international uh, espionage. And th it's, it's just a remarkable story. And at one point, very much toward the end, where I think you were starting to look back on it, you wrote, at times, it seemed to me that Mark Bettern, Robert Moe, and Kevin Montgomery were merely actors in a play directed by someone else. And I could see why you said that. And I thought this might give us a starting point rather than, you know, where do you begin to tell mm -hmm. the story? Perhaps thinking of it as a play, you might give us the short, the short biography of what each one of these three actors, mm -hmm. what his role is in this story. And then we can figure out whether you think the story is a tragedy or a comedy, perhaps. Sure. Um, but that might give us a way to start talking about the, <laughs> I, yeah, the, the it's sort of ordinary but incredible yeah. goings on in this, right. in this plot. Yeah, it's interesting that you picked out those lines. Um, I wrote that after having structured the book mm -hmm. in three acts and and you know I was lucky enough that the story lent itself to being structured that way because it is a true story and there were a lot of interesting twists and turns um and part of me what drew it to what drew me to the story was the fact that all of the characters were complex so nobody was either just good or bad and it wasn't um a typical true crime story in the sense mm -hmm. you have this good guy and a bad guy. And um, I, my hope is that it makes readers think about these issues in different ways. Um, None of them seemed but, like the mastermind of the no. operation either. Right, also, they, also they, true. Yeah, right. they seemed like people. Yeah, well, so the other thing that drew me to the story is it's, I was living in China uh, mm -hmm. working for science when I read about this man, Robert Moore, who had been found near a cornfield in Iowa. Um, <laughs> it was a Monsanto field. Yep. And his appearance there set off this massive FBI investigation. And it was a trade secrets theft investigation, spanned several years. It involved you know, everything from car <laughs> chases to the FBI actually flying surveillance planes overhead at one point. So just yep. really massive response. And part of what drew me to that story was that um, it's just one of dozens of such cases that have played out over the past few years involving mm -hmm. um, scientists with ties to China. And so looking at that case seemed a way to get at this larger issue of what's going on with these investigations and with the charges that are being brought um, almost weekly uh, involving scientists from China. No, I think it was Kevin I wrote down a note at one point and I yeah. wondered whether he was uh, more tragic or quixotic. I thought <laughs> he, he was, was my favorite. <laughs> yeah. well, he's yeah, he's very likable. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, uh, so there are three character, right. three main characters. Yeah. Um, Robert Moore, the, the, he's a Chinese born engineer who lived in, lived in Florida. A naturalized uh, his family. He was, he did not become a U.S. citizen, but okay. his okay. wife, and his children were born here right. in you know, many ways, felt like an American, um, was found near this cornfield. Um, the second character is the FBI agent who then hears about this incident and takes on the case and ends up overseeing dozens of agents in multiple states and um, directing this immense operation. And then the third character is the one you mentioned, Kevin, who is a um, seed breeder and a farmer from uh, Illinois who ends up kind of caught in the middle of this whole operation. Um, he was hired as a consultant by Robert's company um, to do what he thought was legitimate work. And then he ends up, um, well, he, he ends up one day, the, the FBI knocks on his door uh, and says, you know, what have you been doing dealing with this Chinese company? And he ends up becoming an informant for the FBI. Uh, there's, and it should, I should odd. add that he had no awareness of- I was no, gonna say, he was clueless. Yeah. He was like, right. you know, so Robert, I think you indicated Robert's like he, yeah. you know, uh, in some of the interviews early on with the companies, like, that's an odd question. Why would they ask yeah. that question, you know? 
He well, did have, yeah, he did have his doubts. And so Robert's company um, was called DBN. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Beijing agricultural company. Um, Robert studied thermodynamics, so nothing to do with agriculture, um, but had this kind of classic academic story where after he finished his second PhD, he failed to find a tenure track position. And so he, <laughs> you know, ended up turning to a life of crime. Not it wasn't that direct. <laughs> but, <laughs> but only, 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 only academics. But in the really funny. But, in that tragic, <laughs> tragic yeah. comedy sort of way, he got to it sort of one small step at a time, and then became engulfed pretty much before. That's and, right. And yeah, it wasn't of, that. He, yeah. Thinking of Kevin, I'm sorry, but there's this yeah. huge contrast too because Kevin was this guy who likes breeding, and he crosses seeds out in his backyard, mm -hmm. hoping that he can sell them sometime to China. And so he gets involved and lurking behind them is DBN in China and Monsanto and Pioneer Seed back here that are like the hugest agricultural conglomerates in the world. And so mm -hmm. when you say, so here was a Mark, the FBI agent out in the middle of Iowa. And before you know it, we've got helicopters surveying half the state and dozens. Yeah, actual airplanes. They were airplanes, that's right. The, yeah. the, dark, the yeah. dark airplanes and things. It's like, and the yeah. whole thing just seems to get monstrously out of hand. Yes. <laughs> awfully easily yeah. somehow. Yeah, and you know, I think out of hand on both sides. Yeah. So on the one hand, um, so DBN's scheme to steal corn, and, and it should go just to, Robert didn't immediately turn to a life of crime. He, what happened was he got, found this job with this agricultural company through Run his by his brother-in-law. Yes, so through nepotism, he gets yeah. this job. He's doing at first legal work, um, sourcing animal feed from the US, uh, working, brokering business deals, you know, for this Beijing company to acquire companies in the West. And then little by little, his work becomes more questionable and his boss in Beijing gets this idea to steal seeds from mm -hmm. the competition and then reverse engineer them back in China. And so that's when he ends up uh, embroiled in this international agricultural espionage operation. Um, but it is, it is, I should say, it was somewhat out of hand at some point, but it was also fairly harebrained and hazard. And, yeah. um, well, and each, each in the yeah. usual way, each small step seemed like just a small step. And it's like, and then before you know it, uh, uh, but you, the, the scheme for trying to steal these seeds from Monsanto and Pioneer, basically, uh, you made the important observation that research takes a long time and theft doesn't. That's right. I mean, there's so there are a number of people who research this issue of whether IP theft makes sense in the long run. And for, for most companies, it's not a great long-term strategy because mm -hmm. you steal a technology and then five years later, that technology is going to be out of date. And unless right. you have the research staff to update it um, with, 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 seeds that's quite difficult you you, you know build up the um, ip over many years so unless you have that research staff in place you're gonna have to steal the technology again or you know come mm -hmm. up with some other way to get it um but in the short term it can be a way to get a leg up on the competition yeah and a lot of companies in china have rather short-term goals because mm -hmm. you know the nature of the economy and the government and so forth I'm hoping that people listening are starting to piece together some idea of what the story is about because it's without reading the entire book, it's awfully hard to get wow. the overview of all these mm -hmm. players involved uh, and the, the what ends up being this intellectual property uh, international spying thing to steal the IP from these seed breeds. But that is a huge, huge, huge thing for Monsanto and Pioneer to maintain their control over these seeds too, isn't it? That's, you had, that? yeah, I'm sorry. You had some, something like uh, at one point, 85% of the U.S.'s corn mm -hmm. is Monsanto corn. 
Oh, so now, yeah, it's now close to 80%. That 80%. is 80%. Pioneer and DuPont and, and, and Monsanto. But actually, but those yeah, companies have but also that, merged that with others. Could, so, yeah, that's another We think thing. of those as, you know, little Iowa family farmers, but we're talking a major <laughs> yeah. agribusiness and billions of dollars here. Oh, right, right. And so that was an issue that I, I mean, I was... I was drawn to the story because the the players in it were so complex, and part of that was that Monsanto is an unlikely victim in any story. Um, yes. You know, for, for many people, Monsanto, you, even people don't know about the industry. Monsanto still evokes a kind of mm -hmm. a certain sort of association. Um, but you know, once I started doing more reporting and talking to farmers, um, talking to experts on the seed industry, and also to IP lawyers. I realized that there's this other story, which is that um, companies like Monsanto and DuPont Pioneer, um, which are now uh, Dow DuPont and mm -hmm. Bayer, acquired Monsanto, Bayer, yeah. um, they they spend massive amounts uh, trying to protect their IP um, and and also trying to kind of shut out other players in the market. And as they've gotten bigger, they have spent less and less as a proportion of sales on research. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the bottom line, what what's the best way to protect research and innovation in America? Yeah. Um, you know, protect, uh, guarding against IP theft is one thing, but we also have to think about this other issue, which is consolidation and corporate control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to wrap all these issues into the book through this and tell it in a, yes. It's still gripping narrative and scene by scene. Yes, um, but but because of the different characters I chose, they they kind of came out naturally. Well, yeah, I think so Kevin, for example, raised this issue of corporate mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I I well, I have to say, one of the most amusing things about the book is this <laughs> image of these Chinese guys wandering through cornfields. <laughs> actually trying to get seeds and someone's sitting in the car, the getaway car, more or less. I mean, and, and the fact that, you know, the guy's probably not wearing a business suit, but the story morphs into he's wearing a Chinese man in a business suit is walking through cornfields. And yeah. Right. So there's this kind of game at tel of telephone at the beginning where a farmer <laughs> spots Robert's colleague in the field, calls the police um, and says, you know the farm. The guy in the field's wearing like polo shirt and yeah. pants, and, and he's that suspicious. turns into a suit. And um, his ethnicity comes into play quite early on, mm -hmm. uh, which, which you know, has been an issue in other investigations that the the FBI has brought. And um, so, you know, partly because <laughs> the case had these all these all these kind of weird moments, and I had a lot of visibility into those moments. Um, because yes. it dragged on in, in, it didn't go to trial, but it dragged on in court um, mm -hmm. in discovery phase for several years. And so it had transcripts of what the um, various characters were saying to each other, like as they were driving across the Midwest, looking for corn, yes. um, what uh, uh, even what the FBI agent was saying to, um, <laughs> other, to his colleagues at various points. So yes. it was a remarkable degree of visibility and I feel you know, fortunate Fortunately, yeah. I have it. And it, it all seems like the most ridiculous plot that no one would ever believe if they saw it in a movie. Yeah, I actually had it. There was, <laughs> there was one Amazon review where the guy wrote, you know, the dialogue is kind of weird and this just it just doesn't seem believable. And I, I think maybe he didn't realize that it was a nonfiction book. So I well, don't know, truth is stranger than fiction. This is a good yeah. a good point before I hand back to Joanne because I wanted to yeah. tell you how much I appreciated your note about the sources at the end, where you very carefully described uh, what you were working with, where all of the things like the thoughts that that you wrote down, the quotations that you mm. used, how you could source them all to various people that you either talked to or direct statements in uh, discovery and the various other things. And um, and how you managed all of that, uh, so that the it, at least the reader finds out at the end that all those things you say you couldn't imagine actually happened, actually happened, and and you've got the goods mm -hmm. on them. Uh, that was that was a very helpful note, I thought, and and 
lint uh, lint lint a special uh, a special use to your reporting on this. I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. There were a lot of the scenes I could reconstruct um, from actual documents where you know I had trans mm. transcriptions of of um, the bugs that were placed in the cars as people were driving in, around corn area, um, sorry, cornfields. And, uh, and in other places, I was able to reconstruct the dialogue like through extensive interviews um, and so forth. And I tried wherever possible to do that with, you know, by interviewing all the different parties right. in the scene, all the people who were involved. Um, and then I, in the notes indicated which method yeah. I use. Because and you've talked quite a bit to, to Robert Mo himself uh, about yes. these things too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. He was right. he was forthcoming and yeah, and just <laughs> driving around the cornfields of Iowa, stopping occasionally to look in cornfields wearing inappropriate clothing, and a car being bugged and talking about how all these things they're doing is illegal, uh, just is incredible. Yes, <laughs> you know, at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, and yet normal. Well, right. So, so what I what I learned um, from talking with Kevin, other seed breeders, is that in some ways this is just business as usual mm -hmm. for the for the seed industry and the companies like you know Monsanto and Pioneer have been stealing IP from each other for years or accusing each other of stealing it anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, there used to be something called flashlight breeding yes. where <laughs> breeders would actually go out into the. I, I, I don't know if they would go at night, but the, the implications that they go out into the um, competitor's fields and dig up the seed out of the ground. So you know, in many ways, this is an old method. Um, the difference is that because it's a case involving a Chinese company, yes. uh, it in carries criminal charges and people go to prison for many years in some cases. Uh, Robert Moore did end up going to prison, and there have been other cases where people have gotten terms of over 10 years. And so there's been this big shift in the way we deal with those kind of uh, that was violations. A, another important aspect that you, you brought up that this demonstrates is like this used to be the sort of thing that was handled as a civil court infraction. And is it really appropriate to be using all the agents of the FBI for this intercompany spat about mm -hmm. intellectual property that involves Chinese company and American companies uh, would bother some people. I think it bothers me some, uh, but that has changed. That's from recent times from 1999, was it? In 96, the, yeah. Yeah, uh, where yeah, it suddenly and became a federal offense to do these things, probably thanks to uh, lots of lobbying dollars from Monsanto at the time. Well, I don't know. I did not, was not not able uh, to do that. Yeah, but there, there were a number of corporations that pushed for um, trade, se trade secrets left to be made into a, a federal crime. Yeah. Um, you know, there were other reasons too. It was becoming a lot easier to steal IP because of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, you had, because of the end of the Cold War, you had a lot of agents out of work who went to mm -hmm. then work for corporations. And, and also people in the intelligence community who wanted a reason to hang on to their jobs. Mm -hmm. and, um, yes. and so, you know, there was a push to kind of define a new mission. Um, but really things have escalated in the past two years under um, the Trump DOJ and uh, there's something called the China Initiative now, where they are bringing uh, cases almost weekly, and I, I, it's it'll be interesting to see to what degree um, economic slowdown and COVID-19 will mm. affect that. Um, you know, this is part of a kind of general shift in the way that in the U.S.-China relations, and um, to some yeah. degree, the outbreak is is driving a rift. Interesting. So I, I'm well. I was really grateful that actually you had uh, devoted part of the book to talk about some of the other. It's not exactly industrial espionage, but scientific. They're worried that Chinese scientists who have come here are stealing scientific secrets to make sure they get back, and um, that you know we're having a lot of Chinese scientists being sent home or put in jail 
for, you know, their, you know, or even just being sent home because of suspicion mm -hmm. that they may be trying to get biomedical secrets or other, you know, um, should, should high we physics. Should we mention the, uh, the thousand secret. grains of sand theory? Uh, at this point. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, you know, as I as I went deeper into this case of Robert Moore and started talking to experts on I, I realized that I needed to understand the way that the FBI has historically handled mm -hmm. these investigations. Um, there are a lot of concerns now within the community of um ethnic Chinese and Chinese American scientists in the US and, and just the general community of scientists that people are being singled out unfairly, um, that there's racial profiling. And um, you know, even though Robert Moore in his case had clearly committed the crime, um, those issues all kind of swirled around in the background. Um, so if you go back um, to the 1990s, and this theory still shapes investigations today. Uh, there is this idea that um, China used this thousand grains of sand approach to spying. Mm -hmm. And so that was the notion that if intelligence collection were aimed at determining the composition of sand on a beach, that the US and Russia would use these kind of James Bond like tactics yes. to go you know, they would send stealth missions or they would scan, they would you know, use scanners to determine the composition of the scan, of the sand, sorry, um, and do this all in the dead of night. And whereas China would send thousands of people to the beach, they would each uh, take home their towels at the end of the day and shake out their towels and they would somehow capture the sand that way. Um, I mean, when I first read about that theory, I thought that is... <laughs> <laughs> it seems specious for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that it so clearly harkens back to the notion of like of yellow peril and of yes. cords mm -hmm. of like it's such um, a fraught idea. Um, the second is that having lived in China, um, you know, it's a country with a bureaucracy that never functions as well as you would assume, yeah. and so this idea that somehow. They could organize so many people to go yeah. collect little bits and bring it back, right? So I mean, there's no doubt that now there is this priority within the Ch um, Chinese Communist Party on on obtaining technology, um, and but it isn't so much that the government's like sending spies out in most cases and saying you know go forth and steal corn. Mm -hmm. um, instead, it's that companies like DBN know that there will be no few repercussions or no repercussions mm. if they do steal something. And, and this is a very different picture. Um, you know, China does have a very, it does have a professional spying uh, apparatus, but when it comes to technology, it's typically much more distributed. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely the case with the corn theft. And it was convenient for xenophobes at the FBI and things who wanted to have people to investigate and to blame people for something. Well, it's a very kind of pat theory. Um, it did influence the investigation of Wen, Wen Ho Lee, um, mm -hmm. the Los Alamos scientist um, who, who was held in solitary confinement uh, for a number of months in 1999 uh, and then was ultimately cleared of most of the charges against him. Um, it, you know, that's a case that still is it, is memorable for, or sorry, many, it's front and center in many people's minds mm -hmm. today, um, especially uh, Chinese American scientists who went through that period. And now they're seeing um, a, many, many cases brought involving um, their mm -hmm. colleagues. And there have been recent cases where people were arrested um, and then later like a few months later, it turned out that the government got the science wrong in the charges, and so mm -hmm. the charges were dropped. Mm -hmm. so that is a real risk because these are very, often very complex technologies. Even if you look at something like seed breeding, it's complex. Mm -hmm. um, the structure of the Chinese government is complex. And so you have FBI agents who are tasked with deciphering all of this. And if you mm -hmm. add in this lens of, possible ethnic bias, um, you can 
end up making mistakes. Well, and then, <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah, the Los Alamos case, sorry, is, mm -hmm. this is a parenthesis, I promise. The Los Alamos case was familiar because I was a career physicist for a while and just made it to the pages of Physics Today where we hear about these sorts of things. And I think for most physicists, it's very easy to understand that uh, sometimes you take work home, sometimes you're not always uh, thinking about security and things, you're just trying to get the work done. And there's always the feeling that, uh, it's easy to have the feeling that everything you do could be misconstrued as spying. Yeah, I mean, so still with the Wenholi case, that seems to be the one that um, provokes the most debate mm. even today. Uh, mm. There have been a number of people who called me up after the book came out to say, look, he was guilty. <laughs> and I think, uh -huh. well, you know, he did not get a fair, he did not get a fair shake. No. So let's debate whether he was guilty, like if he had gotten a fair trial um, yeah. and a fair investigation, you know, without his name being leaked to the New York Times, uh, mm -hmm. had of even being charged with anything, then then we might be able to um, talk about it. But I, you know, ultimately, there that case was based on a faulty assumption, which mm -hmm. was that um, China had obtained nuclear secrets. And there was an, then this assumption that they had to have come from mm -hmm. a um, ethnic Chinese scientist within a U.S. lab, and you know there are several um, errors that were made along the way. Yeah, uh, and you know, and Americans, as as we saw in the early '50s, Americans seem very good at imagining uh, those sorts of things and and figuring that there's no way the Soviets could have figured out at all how to build an atom bomb. Even though right. scientists would say, "Of course they could. It's not. It, it's not that hard to understand. The technology is difficult." Right. So we do have this tendency to assume when when an adversary gets a technology, mm -hmm. just to assume that is it's necessarily different. the product of theft, yeah. um, and not that they could have developed it on their own. Or um, you know, somebody told me um, <laughs> that the difficult thing, the really difficult thing, is to create the technology the first time. Mm -hmm. So once it's it's the it's the act of imagining it that's once you know it can be done. Right. It makes a vast difference. Yeah. Right. So once once the Americans have something and then the, the you know the Russians and Chinese are much more easily able to follow it simply because it's it's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. It exists. It exists. Yeah. So but and then anyway. oh sorry. Oh no go ahead. I'll yeah. let you finish your thought. No, just to go back to the issue of um, physics, um, there was there is another case involving a, a physicist, uh, and that's the case of Xiaoxing Xi, who was the interim head of the um, of the physics department at Temple University in mm -hmm. Philadelphia. Yeah. And yes. it, so he was arrested, and that and um, he says at gunpoint, and the, and then several months later, um, several experts in his field including the person who invented the device that he was accused of trying to transfer to China, right. um, submitted affidavits saying, you know, this is, you know, this case is completely Absurd. unfounded. And so the charges were dropped in this case. Right. And I think there was some difficulty with the, the Robert Moe case in that, you know, how can we prove these seeds had the proprietary information if DuPont and Monsanto aren't going to share their proprietary information? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, that that is the strange wrinkle in these cases that. Um, right. So they're not going to share. They don't want to share. Can, but then again, they, they want to say they want to say, yes, they stole ours. Well, how can we show? Oh, I well, we're not going to say that. <laughs> yeah, I can see from the company's perspective, too. They're trying to they're trying to protect their IP. So they don't want it to leak out during trial. Right. Um, but on the other hand, if you're trying to prove something was stolen, you need to have some visibility in the IP. I think the, 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 the issue that then comes up is that it's enough to show that somebody intended to steal technology and um, that they thought it was proprietary. And so that that's a way to get around the question of whether it actually was. Yeah, I just imagine this whole courtroom full of lawyers and lawyers on top of lawyers, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, a lot of lawyers involved. I had the the feeling while I was reading this that that you had to learn how to do lots of things like get at court documents that you'd never had to do before. So 
I'm wondering in a general way about you know your experience and personally in writing writing this book and doing the research about about all the things that you learned and experiences that you had and what 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 that was like. It's kind of a softball question, but oh yeah, but, yeah. I think it's a good well, question. Still, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I think um, it is interesting. Yeah, well, so I was living in China when I started doing the research and then moved to the US and back to the Midwest. And um, so I had, a, then at the, I lived in China for most of my career as a journalist. So I had a lot of experience in, you know, trying to get information out of Chinese companies and out of the government mm -hmm. and trying to find statistics such as they are there. And um, moving back to the US, I think the, the beautiful thing was being able to use um, the Freedom of Information Act mm -hmm. to get information. Um, I did manage to get uh, quite a few pages on a on an historic FBI program that was targeting Chinese American scientists. Mm -hmm. And that's something I, I obtained using FOIA. Mm -hmm. um, the court documents and you know being able to show up in court, um, the, the one of the previous books that you mentioned was about a court case that was tried in China. And you know, by contrast, I was able to find out a bit about what happened in that courtroom, but the mm -hmm. records are not public. And so, you know, coming moving back here, I really came to appreciate all of those tools that are available to journalists and to use them. And um, when I placed the, I placed several different FOIA. Re requests for mm -hmm. for um, this program. I, I'd heard from a source that there is a suspicion that in the 60s and 70s, Chinese American scientists were widely targeted for reasons that were fairly specious and um, including US citizens, I should say. So, you know, this mm -hmm. is a time when tensions were, with China were running high, but th these were people who had been in the US for years, had yeah. not even left. and. Mm -hmm. um, and so I FOIAed those documents and then it took two years to get the final um, batch, but they did come in. But you did, so, yes. Yeah. So um, I was um, curious, uh, since you lived in China and you covered science and technology in China mm -hmm. and also in the US, now China's really doing a big push to get some major collaboration or to, to woo scientists from the United States into China, you know, mm -hmm. offering them a good salary, offering them houses, offering so that they can set up these new institutes for research and things like that. So I'm, I'm wondering what's going on in the mind in China. Um, do they really believe that, you know, the West holds a lot of information? Are they so far behind or is this another shortcut? Like, yeah, what are they thinking to, in doing all of this to bring scientists over? Well, a lot of countries have talent programs. Um, the difference with the Chinese one is that it's overseen by the Chinese Communist Party. And I think that's one of the reasons why the FBI has attached special significance to it. Um, but interestingly, you know, when I was working in China, uh, I reported several different stories on that program. It's called the Thousand Talents Program. And um, we'd always reported them from this angle of of, of people getting these grants and then not showing up in China. And so it was this pretty unsuccessful effort to get talent to return to China. Um, and what happened was that there were a number of scholars and this includes both ethnic Chinese and um, non-ethnic Chinese, um, you know, people like Charles Lieber, the head of the, the former head of the chemistry department at Harvard, mm -hmm. yeah. who would take the grant money from China uh, they and not report it to the U.S. institutions, mm -hmm. and then uh, they would also not show up in China typically. Interesting. Hot shots. Who the program is directed at getting them to settle down in China, but it really never achieved that goal um, for various reasons. That there's no tenure, um, the quality of life, and just general kind of cronyism within Chinese institutions, and so. The FBI becomes concerned because it's tied to the CCP, and it and it is also, of course, a, a violation of NIH policy to be mm -hmm. 
you know, accepting yes. money from the U.S. government and then going to China and accepting money from the Chinese government and um, not reporting it. Um, so it's definitely something that the NIH need, needs to address. Uh, but in the past few years, what's happened is that the FBI has worked together with the NIH and they've gone into institutions, um, sometimes shut down labs, put researchers on leave. Um, in some cases, like the Charles Lieber case brought criminal charges. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear which of those tools are effective. Because the shutting, I, I went, um, so in the book, Robert Moe develops an illness and ends up getting treatment at MD Anderson mm -hmm. Center in Houston. And that's one of the centers that yes. was the subject of this big FBI. Yeah, and I, I remember that. So I, that's, that development in his own personal story seemed like a way to work in that larger story of this crackdown on grant fraud. So I, I went to Houston, mm -hmm. um, talked to a number of researchers there and tried to piece together what the story was. Um, and the shutting down of labs and then putting people on leave um, had created just an enormous disruption. And among many researchers, this feeling like they were being singled out because, mm -hmm. because of their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And in the end, no criminal charges were brought. Um, many people did leave for China. Um, some of them resigned some were pushed out and some, it just seems like they were fed up with the kind of general atmosphere. And so, you know, ironically, if the goal is to keep researchers in the, in the United States, and if we're in a battle with China for talent, mm -hmm. um, this method of, of going in with these sort of heavy handed investigations seems to be pushing people back to China. Back. Okay. Um, so yeah, I do wonder. Relations, we should deal with them. Um, but there are a lot of people saying, well, can we deal with this in a different way? Right. Yeah, it's interesting because I know so many Chinese academics, you know, they are here for whatever reason. Maybe they came to school mm -hmm. in the U.S. and then decided to stay. Um, you know, they did grad school here and then decided to continue and stay. I do wonder what's going on in everybody's heads. Like, Wow, well, yeah. is the atmosphere so bad that I should return or not? Well, yeah. and the number of people who've committed fraud or IP theft is it's a very small proportion of the mm -hmm. overall research yeah. population. And um, so much of the U.S. research forest is foreign born. And yes. much of it, um, it is ethnic Chinese. And so we need to, we need to figure out how to... Um, I, if we're going to address the issue of IP theft, we need to do it in a way that makes people feel welcome and like they are not being targeted unfairly. Right. So I um, went to co go college in Iowa, and so the cornfields are familiar, but then also <laughs> more in that as this story blossoms and, and gets out of control, it embroils the one-time governor of Iowa who became the uh, ambassador to China because he was uh, previously acquainted, if not friendly, with uh, Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and he's concerned for something that everyone can understand. It's like, I don't want this China thing to become some general hate China thing because schools like one I went to in Iowa depend on a stream of Chinese students who can pay the tuition. Right. That's there are right. threads everywhere. That right. And I mean, so it shows the degree to which we're connected to China in, in many ways. And no. so, um, you know, it's complex. So this, these <laughs> investigations involving Chinese scientists, they were start, they'd started to play out under the Obama DOJ. Yeah. Um, but then after Trump came into office, brought with him a lot of xenophobia and you know, appointed um, traded, a trade advisor who was just extremely hawkish on China, mm -hmm. um, Navarro. And so Trump himself has said at some point that all Chinese students are spies. Mm -hmm. uh, and people in his administration have said think, think, things along those lines too. It's a thousand it's certainly, of sand. <laughs> right. Well, so in all, this certainly does not help the general atmosphere. And I think we've seen also in the past few weeks, 
um, with the outbreak of COVID-19 that the, there's this very, people are very quick to go to racism, yeah. uh, both the Trump in the Trump administration, also just average people in the streets. Mm -hmm. yes. And it's really alarming. Um, and it's something that, you know, I, I had seen in these, uh, in these cases that I looked at, but now that is, that is everywhere. But you did, you did do a, an excellent job of finding a narrative that was uh, compelling and ridiculous at the same time that uh, gave you a hook for looking at, at this amazing number of, of little interwoven network of threads and all these stories that, that impinge. It, it turned out to be surprisingly, I don't know, full-bodied um, oh. by, by the end, yeah. I thought. And uh, that you could organize your way through that is also uh, quite an achievement, really. Yeah, I, I, re, I um, restructured it several times. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Just, yeah. I, I, yeah, I wonder how you put that all together. Like, how do I how do I make this all work? So, I think it was yeah. worth the I effort. Used several, you know, I think a really good reference um, was the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. Mm -hmm. Yes, because she weaves together all of these different threads uh, and mm -hmm. does it so seamlessly. And she has this historical story that's running through um, this mm -hmm. more contemporary mm -hmm. story and personal and, narrative. Yeah. Right? So, um, yeah. Evan Ratliff's The Mastermind was another reference that I used. Um, because that's a that's a really, I mean, he's got this very propulsive, like international crime story um, that's more dramatic in some ways because it involves murder and drugs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, there are so many characters in that book um, that he had to kind of focus it and organize in it, organize it. And so uh, he has these first person chapters that are mm -hmm. um, that are dispersed throughout the book right. and that kind of anchor the reporting and give give the reader a little sense of like what journey am I on? And so I found that helpful too. And you're present in this book, not not in an, a largely forward way, but but right. you're there. There's some per, first person there, and that seems to be something that uh, that's becoming more common in in journalism of this type. That I think I think is a very nice thing. Um. And actually, I have a question from someone on Facebook, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, so he says, um, you mentioned the subject somewhat earlier, but have there been any recent major cases in which the Chinese legal system did protect foreign or non-China owned patents, either in the criminal mm -hmm. system or the civil system? He's heard a little bit about trademarks, but not about patents. No, oh, that's a good question. And I don't know the answer to the patent question specifically um, because I've my book was focused on trade secrets, which is sort of the flip side of patents. I do know, I did talk to a number of IP lawyers in China who um, said that increasingly companies are trying to pursue um, these issues in, in Chinese court and that they're having more success um, there have been improvements in the IP regime in China. Uh, you know, to some degree, China now has nine of the most valuable, uh, to nine of the 20 most valuable tech companies in the world. And as these companies become um, formidable powers in, in their own right, they have more IP to protect. And, yeah. you know, so that may change, um, that may change the, the government's general direction on, on the way it treats the issue, but, you know, and for the immediate future, I don't see a, a huge change. Okay. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm going to change subject just a little bit because Jeff brought yeah. up about how we have so many Chinese students in the United States. Mm -hmm. And of course I'm at one of the universities that has the, one of the largest numbers of mm -hmm. uh, international students. And um, I think almost everybody, I did have one student write to me, saying, I'm in Wuhan, I cannot get to my class, can you send me your homework? I said, oh, but your class is online with me, so <laughs> you're good, you can do this. And um, the, um, uh, anyway, so, um, so with the Chinese students, we rely on that income, so much so to the point that our university actually has an insurance policy in case for some reason Chinese students cannot attend. Oh, wow. I guess we're sort of, yeah. 
I don't know, unique in that way or one of yeah. the leaders in doing that, which I thought was interesting. Um, but the, the other thing, I so I thought, wow, that's amazing. And I can tell in my non-majors online classes, I have a lot of Chinese students, a lot of international students in general, but a lot of Chinese students because, you know, it's easier to engage with the English if you can go through the lecture several times at your own pace, think about the, you know, timing of an asynchronous session and things like that. But the one issue I um, seem to run across a lot is that they often don't have the same um, issues. Um, they don't think the same about plagiarism and copyright and things that Americans do. So when we say we don't want you to take things directly from a website and stick it as your answer, mm -hmm. um, we still find that they, they often will do that. And the response mm -hmm. I get is like, oh, why should I write it in my terrible English when it's in beautiful English here? <laughs> But, but there does seem to be um, less of a concern about, you know, what they present. Not, not, now, this is not all the students, but what they present. And I just wonder if that plays into this, even the perception of that plays into it, that we are likely to... The cultural um, difference. I mean, cultural difference. I yeah, I, I don't know. I've, <laughs> I, taught, I taught journalism in China um, mm -hmm. briefly and had students who tried to say this was a cultural issue mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just didn't I don't I, I think I tend to be <laughs> suspicious of cultural essentialist arguments I've heard people who you know from people who are not Chinese make that argument too right um you know the truth is if you go back centuries they're like to the 18 to the 17 to 1800s in the United States uh this is a place of massive plagiarism and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. technologies, right? So Dickens famously came to, visited America in the 1800s and was like, shocked to find his, his books um, yeah. everywhere. Uh, so it could happen anywhere, anytime, yeah. So. Yeah, I do think it's important to enforce norms around yeah. around copying and, and stealing. And, you know, I, um, I do think it's important to enforce Yes, regulations around yeah. theft and grant fraud. I think the question is about how we do it right. and whether the punishment yes. is commensurate with the crime. Um, right. I, I should have foregrounded this all by saying that this has become a major national security issue for the FBI. It's one of their top priorities. Oh, okay. Next to counterterrorism, so that's the degree of importance that's being placed on it, and. I think we do need to have a conversation about whether the U.S. reaction is in proportion with what's happening. And so okay. similar to after 9-11, like, is our response productive or mm -hmm. is it creating other problems? And you, you raise plenty of questions about why it's a top issue for the FBI, whether it's of uh, importance uh, to law, whether it's of importance to the economy, whether it's of importance because they already have the apparatus to do this and they need a new market. Uh, it's, it's a whole complex story. And this narrative lays a lot of it out uh, in, in the most interesting ways. Yeah, I, well, I, you know, comment, it's funny. I <laughs> yeah, I get a lot of, um, I get a lot of feedback you know, I'll see it on Twitter or something, and people are like, I really enjoyed this book. And I thought that, yeah, you would think industrial espionage, well, we like our sort of spy novels and stuff, but I felt like, as you said, there's sort of a, some of the plans were sort of harebrained. So <laughs> it's, it's not like some, you know, mastermind spy going to do this. It's just someone got caught up in this and didn't see a way out. He needs the money to support his family and you know, so yeah, and there's this American farmer caught in the middle, and then, and then even after he, you know, I don't, I don't want to give too much away, but when he sure. ends up in prison, Robert um, is there with other mm -hmm. very well educated Chinese scientists, and so they end up playing ping pong together, mm -hmm. talking about Chinese history. It's just like very well read, mm -hmm. writing um, poetry, twice. and this is the yeah, and this is the state of our um, federal prisons system today, uh, which I think it bears some reflection. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. So yeah, so I thought, well, well, um, I suppose it's always hard, but 
What was your favorite part of working on this book? <laughs> oh, hmm. <laughs> well, you know, being, being from the Midwest and now living in the Midwest again, it, it was, it was lovely to drive through small towns and um, yeah. people were very welcoming. People in rural yeah. China are honestly very welcoming as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it also, I also had to grapple with um, racism and yeah. the rise of Trump and all these other things that were happening at the time that I was doing my reporting. And so it did give me a new perspective on the Midwest. Um, but I think you know, for me, I've got little kids being able to report this story that was close to home, but it was also still global in scope. It was, um, that was really interesting. That's that's interesting. And that's something for the reader too. The, a, a question for, for a lot of the books that we talk about is like, do you feel like you're a different person after you've read the book? And I think the answer is yes. There are all these interesting questions and things that to think about and, and reflect on that seem uh, valuable to think about that we wouldn't even have thought of before. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, and that's a, yeah, that is probably a good time for <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Yeah, if you think about like the immortal life of Henry of the Lax, it's one mm -hmm. of the books that you, mm -hmm. you And so, yeah, I feel I feel different having read this book now. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. Well, I was anticipating uh, you know, ever since I read on natural selection, I've been like, oh, great, you know, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to a new book. So do you have another book in mind or <laughs> it's too soon to think about I another do, book? But I do, but the world is changing so fast. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'd like to write a book no matter what, but I think it, mm -hmm. what it's about, we'll see. Wow. Well, um, you know, before we sign off, I wonder if there's anything else you wanted to add that maybe we didn't cover mm -hmm. and you thought was important to say on anything, your book or whatever. I don't know. You know, okay. people <laughs> in this in this time period, if people do take to reading and um, well, we're all a little bit cooped up at home, I think, yeah. you know, it's a great. They but should choose your book. book. There's an, an audio book version of the book that I, I read part of it. And oh. I heard two. Very fun to work. I heard there were two, yeah. you and yes. some other That's narrators. Right. I read the first person chapters. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Wonderful. So, um, yeah. Um, are you reading anything right now? <laughs> I'm reading a lot of news. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I know, me too. I'm like, I'm not getting. I'm going to tear myself away and and dive into a really good book because I think, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I feel like my um, I I've slowed down on reading a full book because I just can't tear myself away from the computer. So I should yeah. go. So. Yeah. yeah, I've been reading Leslie Jameson's essays, so I'm sure. Just oh, good idea. <laughs> so. All right. Well, um, I guess, you know, it's been wonderful to have you here. I, don't, I guess it has been absolutely wonderful to have you here and to finally speak to you uh, after being a fan of your work and so glad uh, that such a wonderful writer as you is out there. A good, great journalist who can uh, get to, um, yeah, to the bottom of a story and, and, and <laughs> you know, tell it in such a way that we can enjoy it. Like I said, very enjoyable. So uh, we've been talking talking to Mara Hispindel and about her book, The Scientist and the Spy. And uh, definitely, as Mara said, if you're cooped up these days, this, I think this is a good book to read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so great. Uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thank That's you, so everybody, for joining us today. And we'll uh, we'll talk to you again next time on Read Science. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Bye.